A reading from the book of Genesis. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her. And moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the Lord be in your heart and on your lips that you may worthily proclaim his holy gospel in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise to you, O Christ, King of eternal glory. The Lord is a great God. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Harden not your heart. Praise to you, o Christ, King of, King of eternal, eternal glory. The Lord be with you. And the Lord be with you. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory, glory to, to you, Lord. Lord. Jesus began to teach his disciples that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd, and with his disciples, he said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of the Lord. 
Praise, Praise you, you, Christ. Christ. May I speak to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Many people choose to give up something for this period of Lent. Chocolate, cakes, alcohol, for example. But many people take on something, maybe <coughs> an extra time of prayer and a time of quiet thinking. All these practices are excellent in themselves. But for me, the real purposes are so that we can discipline ourselves to listen to God and what is being asked of us in this time of challenge and urgency. A world of fragmentation and anxiety and a measure of fear about what the future holds. The world has always had these elements, but this year has been challenging in ways that we could never even have thought about. So this is a good time to ask ourselves, what does Lent mean for me? Father Tim implemented this question for us all on Ash Wednesday when we began the journey through the 40 days. Well, right now, it's confession time. Why? Because I have had to think long and very hard, what does Lent mean for me? What is God still asking of me? Why do I say still? Because I can't really remember a time of not observing Lent. And that is more years than I care to share at this time. So for me, Lent is a time of hearing God's call again and again. What is required of me? But very importantly, it has always been for me and still is about going the extra mile, participating in all that it means, the worship that we share, the prayers, learning something new together, perhaps a group, perhaps giving in whatever ways I can of myself, making new observations and by grace, sticking to them. The Old Testament readings for Lent focus on covenant and to encourage us and all those who have gone before us. Last week, we heard of the promises to Noah. The covenant to Noah was for all of humanity and all that creation was and meant. Today's reading to Abraham is very <coughs> focused. God promises huge things to both of them. God's covenant with Abraham is a series of steps that leads him to a much deeper exploration of the faithfulness of God. That, of course, is always a two-way process. Both have to trust each other. A series of steps. That is how I view my journeys of Lent, and not just Lent, but my personal journey. Sometimes those steps are very clear and very straightforward, and other times there are moments of real testing, very much like Abraham. What do I have to do next? That may resonate very well with yourselves. I think of life as a series of steps, and that brings me on to today's gospel. We all have our cross to bear. You will have heard that many times, sometimes said with sarcastic implications to us who are here on the journey and almost said to us with tongue in cheek. 
But for Jesus, this is a serious invitation. And he tells us this message also is for everyone, for all. Jesus calls the crowd to him. Come and listen, he says. The disciples are busy regrouping after blessed Peter has messed up when Jesus asked them who they and others thought that he was. Like a group of very naughty children, he called them, and I'm sure that they all felt that rebuke, which was directed at the ringleader, impetuous Peter. They most likely all thought the same that this suffering and even death should come to their master and friend? Why can't he just stay with them, with things as they are? Their hearts must have been willing him to turn back before it was all too late. Peter is the one daring to voice that. And note that he called the crowd to him now. And we stand when Jesus calls with that crowd and the eyes of Jesus upon us. What is happening? Are we going to turn back? This is a message for all, not just for the disciples or those who have been called to ministry. The disciples were to hear that picking up the cross requires a few minor adjustments to life. And Jesus uses commanding language to get us to hear, follow, deny, take up. He says, follow after me, deny oneself, take up your cross and follow me. I have a number, in fact, quite a collection of crosses that I've collected over the years. And I use these in lots of different ways in the schools and they love to see them and they love to hear stories about the cross. The cross sometimes is very dark. Sometimes it's light and almost shining. Sometimes it's very rough and sharp and very heavy. It has been portrayed in art and sculpture in beautiful ways, showing us a shining example of love. Might I suggest that this is a challenge for us to be clear about where do our loyalties lie? It means making conscious decisions to be loyal, to be clear about our commitment to Jesus and to be ready to face the consequences but to be open in our commitment. There may well be, and almost certainly, there will be pain. There will be loss, testing times. But the good news, I believe, that in the end, we will not be the loser. My personal story is long, and I didn't know where to start or even what to share with you because there's so much. And it's full of these kind of experiences. Where did it start? I thank God very much for my mum. She was a very faithful lady and it's only when one starts to look back and see the beauty and the wisdom of her words. She was one of 10 from a very loyal and very committed Methodist family. One of her sisters and her husband were Salvation Army officers. So I had much interaction with the Salvation Army too. I loved this. I loved the music, the joy and the knowledge I learned of Jesus. <laughs> My mum marked out the seasons with such clarity, and that has stayed with me always. Where I grew up in Oxpring in the countryside, it was cut off from buses, and the walk to the village and to the school was well over a mile. It was here in the last year of junior school 
I can remember this and I often think about this. It's got real feelings. I sat next to a boy. He was called Alan. And he introduced me to Ash Wednesday. He was allowed the day off on Ash Wednesday and he told me it was a day of obligation. <clears throat> I wanted to know what that meant. And he explained ashing to me all that long time back. I wanted to know more and more. And of course, he came from a very devout Catholic <coughs> family. The church in Penniston started services in the school where I had gone to the primary school with the hope of building a new dual purpose church built in the village. And my mum allowed me to go to the services at the school. And it was there that I saw an amazing man again, who told me different things about Jesus. He took a lot of the services to help the vic vicar. He was a reader. I was bowled over by Herbert. I wanted to be like him. He helped me to prepare for my confirmation. What a splendid day. Lots of us in our special dresses that we'd had. And wow meeting the Bishop of Wakefield. The new church in Oxpring was built not long after and I became very involved as a Sunday school teacher. And by now I could play the piano well enough to play for Evensong. And later when the church managed to acquire a one manual organ, I could play that too. By now I was married to Tom. And he full well knew the commitment that I had to doing all these things and was absolutely always behind me. I had a lot of rope. Eventually becoming involved in the parish church as a church warden, the branch leader of the Mother's Union for six years, and all the time being drawn on and taking more and more steps into the life of the church. But there was something else going on. There was a constant calling to do something and be something more. Well, I trained and became a Church of England reader. I was licensed in Wakefield Cathedral in October, 1980. I worked alongside the rector of the parish of Penniston, which was very, far flung indeed, with very outlying churches in rural farming communities. And I found myself being responsible for leading Evensong in one of these places most weeks. And he spent a lot of time teaching me an amazing amount of ministry. I had a very privileged part in sharing and teaching collective worship <laughs> in the infant school at St. John's where I worked. A joy to share with the staff, and I still do. I've watched their growth in their journey. All the time, I had this overwhelming feeling of being called on to ministry in other ways. Some of this was fulfilled by the enormous privilege of being part of the amazing Wakefield Diocesan Mission Team, which was led first of all by John Finney and then by Stephen Cottrell. At one point, it had within it a 10-day mission to the Diocese of Chester. The blessings and the learning curve was amazing. I was then asked by the Bishop of Wakefield to go off on a Women in Mission conference. All of this again, I have to say thank you to Tom for allowing me this space to explore and to see yet again, what is God still asking of me? The cross, the very difficult and painful part now was that my rector could not allow his heart to send me on a selection conference. His very real issues with women prevented this, but the pain had been 
that I could do other kinds and all kinds of other ministry. A very big and sincere thank you to the diocesan bishop of Wakefield at the time who showed compassion and care. And like Simon from Cyrene, he stepped out and helped me to carry what had now, in his description, had become a cross. That bishop was Nigel McCulloch. The next step with a lot of discussion and a lot more things involved was very scary and felt very unsure because he said that I needed to move. And he asked me to come to the parish of Cawthorn and work alongside the priest at the time, the Reverend John Wilkinson. It was there that my value and my confidence and being loved was restored. The parish of Cawthorn supported me wholeheartedly in sending me for selection. Another overwhelming bit of this is, it was in Chester. That's where I'd spent 10 days on mission. And it felt like God had got there before me and was already waiting. I was at home. It was a wonderful experience, but very scary and very testing. The rest is history. My training on the ministry scheme and at, May at Murfield was a very demanding experience. Hard work and very sacrificial on us as a family. I was very supported by the head and staff at the infant school in Penniston and was allowed time off on Fridays when I needed to be at Murfield for the whole weekend. By now, it had been thought it would be a good idea if I lived in Cawthorn. My priesting service, as many of you know, because many of you shared it, was the very first that the diocese had done in a parish setting. I was now supported by a new diocesan bishop, Stephen Platten. That service was overwhelming and attended by so many people. That was on the 21st of June, 17 years ago. And the incumbent who had taken me through my training and the, the beginning of my deacon year was to leave the parish very earlier than, than had been expected. That was another cross moment. But what a joy when Father Wayne, the vicar of Darton, agreed to take me on and to take on also the parish of Cawthorn, all under his wing. Another step of wondering Am I going to keep going? How is all this going to be? Come, follow me. No need to worry. Jesus said that. And for me, this was an amazing time of growth in Father Wayne's care, teaching and love. Here, I stop and call to mind the sixth station. Jesus struggling down the road to Golgotha and Veronica steps forward and wipes his face with her veil, leaving the imprint of his image and blessing her because of her kindness to him as he passed. And that for me happened here in this parish with Father Wayne. There are so many more endless, endless stories that I would love to share with you. Lots of work with the young people back in Penniston, and they still keep in touch with me, watching them grow. The joy of being allowed to work here in this United Benefice, which, as you all know, has come through many stages since I have been here. And now, what a joy to be waiting to do some more work with Father Tim after this lockdown eases, please. Giving thanks then for me in this Lent is about the opportunity of serving and especially in the other parishes that I've covered in their time of need. The work in the school, the weddings, the funerals, the baptism, listening to people's stories. 
living in the presence of the God who has constantly called me alongside all of you to change, to grow, to make adjustments. We come to realize that through this following, we have strength beyond our own imagining and capabilities. So I share with you the challenge now of what I think Lent is about. Let us together try to be clear about our loyalties when we make that decision. And you know what? It's a tough one to follow, to take on the consequences. But I do believe we will not lose out on this transaction. May God give us the strength to stay and not turn back. I take much consolation from a prayer of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Herbert, I'm taking us right back now to Herbert, the reader, because I used to listen to him saying this prayer so fervently and I wanted to understand it better. And I hold it out to all of us today in memory and thanks of Herbert, but for all of us in this Lent. Teach us, good Lord, to serve you as you deserve, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labour and not to ask for any reward, save that of knowing that we do your will. Amen. Amen.